Welcome back. In the last video, we looked at the sensitivity of the logistic growth model to its population growth rate parameter, little r. Um, we showed that as little r increased, we could go from a model that goes has this nice sigmoidal shape that starts low and goes up to a nice stable equilibrium, uh, to a damped oscillation, to a stable two-point oscillation, four-point oscillation, eight-point oscillation, uh, chaotic, oscill chaotic non-periodic uh, oscillation that never repeats that looks like stochasticity, but is a purely deterministic calculation. <clears throat> in this video, we're going to dive into the, the sensitivity of this model to its initial conditions. Um, so in the logistic model, there's two parameters, R and K. And here, N at time zero and zero is what we're going to call the state variable rather than a parameter. So I'm going to start by returning the population growth rate to one that gives a nice stable equilibrium uh, and compare the dynamics and look at how our predictions of this model differ as we change the initial conditions. Uh, so here I'm setting little r equal to one uh, and two runs, a and b, and a, the initial condition is one, and b, the initial condition is 15. <clears throat> very different initial conditions, one below, very low and below the initial condition, the carrying capacity, one uh, decently above the carrying capacity. And we can see uh, that in both cases, they converge after a relatively um, short amount of time uh, to the same value K. So, you know, it, we start low, we go up in that sigmoidal shape. When we start high, we were in that kind of overshoot uh, state, but we so we drop back down. Uh, but since the population growth rate isn't that high, it kind of has a nice gentle return uh, to steady state. Uh, if we increase the value of R to into that damped oscillation range, we see something similar. Um, we started higher, we jumped down, and in fact, um, in some ways, the the they get closer to the carrying capacity and closer to each other, for, you know, pretty quickly. Um, maybe it takes longer for them to truly uh, become the same, but th there's actually a, a, you know, this same uh, behavior of convergence. So in this plot, I've actually instead of looking at uh, the actual magnitude of the oscillations or the magnitude of the population size. I ask the question, how long does it take these two runs to become the same? So what is the rate of convergence? So I've, I've plotted the difference between the two uh, population sizes, and I've taken the absolute values because really I'm just interested in the magnitude of the difference. So how long does it take these two to become this, the same? And we can see that you know, it starts very high, then it drops down, and it's, it's much lower. Um, and then this figure shows the same thing, uh, but now with the y-axis on a log scale. And we can see there's a little bit of initial wiggle, um, initial transient in that. Uh, but all in all, uh, this rate of convergence very much looks like a straight line on a log scale. And remember when we learned about the exponential growth model, that things that look like straight lines on a log scale are things that are varying at an exponential rate. So what we are actually seeing is that in this, this domain where there is a stable equilibrium, whether it's uh, the most stable version of that or whether there's an oscillation to that, that the, uh, the sensitivity of the initial conditions, the impact of the initial conditions on the predictions is, is going away at an exponential rate. So even though I start, we started the two initial conditions very far apart, they're converging to the same answer and they're converging to the same answer at an exponential rate. And so the importance of the initial conditions is it would be very important for short-term predictions, uh, but for longer-term predictions, they're, it's going to go to that same uh, steady state uh, pretty quickly. And in fact, uh, we can estimate the slope of that uh, rate parameter. And here we, I did it just by simple, fitting a simple uh, 
linear model to how the growth rate is changing with time. And we can get an estimate of the slope. So the slope of that is like uh, around minus uh, 0.1. Uh, and so that slope, that slope that determines the rate of exponential uh, convergence is known uh, as a Lyapunov exponent. Uh, it's exponent because the, the rate of convergence is exponential. And this is the, you know, if we look at, uh, uh, yeah, in the exponent, this is the, the rate parameter in that exponential convergence. Okay, so this just reinforces that how in the last figures we've plotted the difference between the two runs as a function of time, both in a linear and log scale. The fact that the plot on the log scale is a straight line implies the difference is uh, changing at exponential rate. And that negative slope uh, means that the runs are converging exponentially. Because remember, if it's, we're just looking at a negative R um, in general, that's you know decaying, exponential decay to zero. And so here, the difference between the two runs is decaying to zero exponentially. Uh, so now let's see what happens uh, if we do these runs within the chaotic domain. So now R is at 2.8, solidly in that chaotic domain. We start at two different initial conditions, one versus five, and uh, the runs never converge. They are never close to, to synchrony. They never really you know they're just kind of bouncing around independent of each other uh so might, we might ask okay what if what if the initial conditions are more similar to each other you know do the, do they then converge if they start off near each other so now we've we've uh brought the two different initial conditions to much closer range you know run a is starting at one run b is starting at 1.1 so really only off uh by 0.1 and we can see that they both go up in sync, uh, but the second one overshoots a little bit more than the first. And so uh, even though they rise up together, uh, they kind of diverge pretty much immediately after that. If they come into sync at any point, it's really almost by chance that they come together once or twice, but they don't come together close enough to then follow the same trajectory after that. Ah, so now I've increased this, the similarity in the initial conditions. So now we're, one is starting at one, one is starting at 1.001. So they're really 0.1% you know, difference. And we now can see they go up together. They follow very similar dynamics, very slight differences. Uh, but then at kind of about time 15, they seem to uh, become different from each other very quickly. So they kind of uh, quickly get out of sync and then they don't get back in sync together. Uh, so the more similar we make the initial conditions, the longer they stay in sync, but they do eventually diverge. And we see this if we make them even more similar, you know, so now the difference between these two is, uh, what is it, one, two, to, down to the, one thousandth, hundred thousandths place. Uh, so incredibly similar, far more similar than our measurement precision would ever let us be on a, any population dynamics. And we see that by making the initial conditions very similar that they do appear to stay in sync uh, longer. But even so, now at kind of point 23, there's a noticeable difference and that noticeable difference uh, grows quite quickly, and then you know by 30, they're you know one's going up, the other's going down. You know they're completely out of sync, and they're not going to ever come back together. So the more we, the more similar the initial conditions are, the longer uh, these two populations uh, stay in sync, but they eventually uh, become divergent. So here we're going to plot the rate of divergence. So again, I'm looking at the absolute difference. Uh, between the two, and we can see that it looks like it's pretty minimal till about you know point time point twenty three, and then it becomes rapidly uh, divergent. And we can do the same trick we did uh, with the two uh, populations that were converging. We can plot that on a log scale. So here we're seeing the the absolute difference 
on a log scale. And this is, you know, roughly linear showing that uh, not only are the two populations diverging, but they're diverging at an exponential rate. Um, and even though, so, and they kind of were always diverging at an exponential rate. It's just that the difference between the two time series didn't become, you know, visually obvious uh, until the absolute magnitude is. And it's only because the difference started out at, you know, 10 to the minus fifth difference uh, and that it, that accumulated difference had to get up till until it was, you know, a percentage or two become before it became visually apparent, but they were still diverging uh, exponentially the whole time. And we see that we have uh, a, a positive Lipanov exponent in this case, in, in this case, uh, about 0.19. So the, again, and, and you can kind of see that the, uh, when we're in the stable domain that the two, um, the two populations of different initial conditions are going to have a negative Lipanov exponent. They're going to converge uh, at exponential rate. And then we're in this chaotic domain. They have a positive Lipanov exponent. So the, the two populations starting from very similar places will diverge at an exponential rate. Um, this kind of just puts some text in there about the slope now being positive and kind of what we're seeing in this case, in when we're in this chaotic regime, is what was what is called uh, sensitive dependence to initial conditions, and that in, in many ways is one of the defining characteristics of chaotic systems, is that they are very sensitive to the initial conditions. So if the initial conditions are off by just a little bit, uh, they will diverge away from each other uh, at an exponential rate. By contrast, in stable systems, they are going to converge back together uh, quite quickly. Um, want to reinforce that these wild oscillations are in fact deterministic. Um, and second, we want to reinforce, reinforce that in any real world prediction problem, um, it's very hard to forecast chaotic systems because any errors in estimating the initial conditions of the state variables will grow very rapidly with time. And that's actually one of the defining challenges of forecasting any chaotic system, whether it's a, a weather forecasting system or you know, a disease system in its chaotic regime or any sort of other chaotic system, is that any uncertainties about the initial conditions become amplified over time. And so on uh, in the next couple of slides, I want to look at that from the perspective of probability uh, on the initial conditions rather than just comparing two runs. So up to now, we've just compared two runs, but in the next couple uh, slides, we're going to look at this instead as saying, what if I have an estimate of the initial conditions and it has some standard deviation? And I'm going to do these runs again in the chaotic domain. So if I think, remember the steady state is 10. If I think I'm at nine, but I have uncertainty about that standard deviation, I have uncertainty captured in that standard deviation, we can see that um, you know, the, the COMPS interval grows quite rapidly. Um, we can kind of predict that there's probably this up and down oscillation for the first couple time points, and then the prediction of the mean becomes stable. And what we're really seeing after about time point six isn't that the population is predicted to be at a steady state. It's just that each ensemble member in a run is so out of sync with each other, all we can really see uh, is a probability distribution. You can kind of see a distribution of predictions, but you can't say where in this cloud of predictions you are. So you can predict the mean of that distribution, but you can't predict any point in time with accuracy. And in fact, if we think about how the atmos atmosphere is chaotic, uh, this is directly analogous to you know the idea that on short time scales we could predict weather, uh, but on long time scales we can predict climate. And saying that even though we can't say what's going to happen on a, any specific time, uh, the the range of variability in the system is still very bound. Like the, this confidence interval is very well defined. The mean is very well defined. Uh, it's just you know it's you know essentially 
for practical purposes, even though this is a deterministic system, you're really not any different than stochasticity in terms of the, the predictability. It's, we really just know about the distribution rather than the exact values. Here, I, we try clamping down uh, that uncertainty in initial conditions. And by clamping down the uncertainty in the initial conditions, we're able to gain some predictability. We're able to you know, have a constant interval that is meaningfully tight for a number of oscillations before uh, we kind of lose that and it converges back uh, again, it's a little more than, little different than a climatology, just to being able to say something about the mean and the, the range and the, the bounds and the, the shape of the probability distribution, but not any, predict any specific point in time meaningfully uh, as an individual, but you can still predict the distribution meaningfully. Um, so yeah, this reinforces that in the figures, the dark line was the median, the shaded region was the 95% confidence interval. Uh, here we see that the confidence in initial conditions increases. The, the, as we increase the confidence in initial conditions, we increase the least length of time where we can forecast the population, but there's still this limit of predictability beyond which we're doing mo no better than this equivalent of climatology, this, this ability to predict the distribution and its statistics. Uh, and this is, like I said, very analogous to weather forecasting where, you know, Lorenz in the late 50s and early 60s, he discovered the atmosphere was chaotic, made this uh, analysis suggesting that the limits of predictability are about 14 days. Um, and what we've seen in, in weather forecasting is a steady progression and improving the accuracy of forecasts closer and closer to this limit. And it's really occurred because of efforts to be able to constrain the initial conditions uh, much, much better. So I, when I teach my forecasting course, I like to say that, you know, there's, you know, tens of billions of dollars invested in weather uh, measurements from satellites and, and airplanes and buoys and uh, balloons and ground stations and radars and stuff like that. And all those things show up in you know pretty apps on your phone to tell you about the weather tomorrow, but that's not why they exist. They, they exist fundamentally to constrain our initial conditions to say, to get a better, better estimate of what is the state of the system right now, because the more confidence we have about the state of a chaotic system at the time that we're making a prediction, the longer we can predict that system meaningfully into the future. 